Thank you. Um, so I'm going to present a book um, that we worked on in 2013 called Take Me to the River, which is the story of Perth Foreshore. A whole bunch of different uh, contributors to that. Um, okay, so look, just with this, I, I will present um, the book and at various points I'll sort of break out into a narrative mode around interpretive research, but otherwise hopefully it's generally entertaining and just give you a flavour of what I'm talking about. So the book was essentially about interpreting um, and understanding pr principally European colonial Australian culture's relationship to, to landscape and indigeneity through a reading of different schemes for Perth foreshores. So it's interpreting different meanings out of the the this sort of geological stratum of schemes which have been produced over the years for the foreshore. It's been a long running kind of contentious site right from the beginning of Perth's sort of colonial culture um, history. And so it's a fascinating um, body of work to draw on by different planners and designers over you know 200 years to understand how they saw Perth as a settlement and how they saw it relating to landscape and indigeneity. So the narrative interpretive research is used to draw meanings out of them. Um, so I'll slip out of the um, that sort of lecture mode. So this is an image um, just to give you some sense of the the time scale that the Swan River, the Derbal Yarragon, uh, in, to give it its, its indigenous name, has been flowing. It's been flowing so long that five kilometres northwest of Rottnest, it's carved a canyon into the continental shelf called the Perth Canyon which is significantly um, deeper than the Grand Canyon. It's been flowing for some 60 million years. So even though it's this kind of muddy, meandering, kind of fairly mild mannered looking river, it is truly ancient. And it's onto that that these schemes have been grafted. Uh, in the indigenous understanding of the river, um, it was that it had been formed by the Woggle, who was a serpentine uh, dream serpentine dreamtime creature, a snake, a spirit, who formed all the water bodies of the southwest of Western Australia. Um, I'll use the words of Kel, uh, Ken Colburn here to explain it. Um, the Woggle eased and coiled his way down the Swan River, creating the bends at the river at Belmont and Maylands as he went. Before he reached the islands at the causeway, he rattled his skin, shaking all the scales off in the mud, he wrestled access to gain access to Perth water. He finally emerged through the narrows. He made another big coil to create the open expanse of water downstream of the narrows. The Woggle then ascended, ascended Mount Eliza through a gap in the limestone cliffs by the way of a small valley uh, behind where the brewery stables were built. And it's an interesting thing because if you look at the bathymetry of the Swan River, there are these depressions in the in the bathymetry in the base of the river, which were referred to as Woggle holes, which are curious. Um, which were regarded as having significance. Uh, a, a European ship in the early days of the colony um, dropped an anchor into one and lost the anchor. An indigenous man from another part of the um, country was sent was sent to dive down to re reclaim the anchor, but never came up again. And perhaps he didn't know the history, but there's a whole bunch of significance about these strange woggle holes, the base of the brewery there. Um, it goes without saying we're standing on indigenous land, not far from Guma on the Edna Banambidara, which was Perth water and is Perth water. Um, 1827, we had the, the Dutch, uh, William de Vlaming arrived and they um, correctly assessed and believed the coast to be desolate and they decided that it wasn't really worth annexing Perth uh, and this landscape. So the surveying of the fertile upper section of the Swan River eventually fell to the English and it was particularly uh, Captain Sterling and Charles Fraser, his botanist. And they um, they sailed up the the, the Derbally Aragon, the Swan River in 1827. They went up to Guildford, which was the only place where there was any really fertile soil. And they did their only soil testing there and then presumed it was always, it was all going to be that good. And they, they were really um, captivated by the landscape. Sterling evoked how the richness of the soil, the bright foliage of the shrubs, the majesty of the surrounding trees, the abrupt and red colours, of the banks of the river occasionally seen and the view of the blue mountains from which we're not far distant made the scenery of this spot as beautiful as anything of the kind I've ever witnessed. Um, these are Frederick Garling's paintings of the Swan River. You can see Mount Eliza in the background. Everything is vertically exaggerated 
and it gives it this wonderful um, romantic quality. Uh, Sterling's accounts of the Swan River were, were um, recounted in English newspapers at the time. And so the Swan River existed as a kind of figment of the English imagination before its reality was well understood. And because of these romantic accounts of the river and this landscape, um, in the English media, it, it triggered what was regarded to regarded as the Swan River mania in England. So in this sort of fevered state, the desires of the aspirational class were projected onto this apparent Arcadia of the Swan River and its landscape. And it's not easy, not hard to be lulled into that, you know, when you look at Frederick Garling's images. Such were Stirling's romantic musings that he persuaded himself that the cool easterly land breeze of these early autumn nights must originate from a range of snowy mountains to the west of Perth, and there's some sense there of their possible ghostly presence. They, they arrived in Perth after an uncommonly moist and cool, cool summer, it should be said, and they got a completely um, skewed perception of the climate and the landscape because of that. So here we get into the first, um, I guess, first instance of a scheme um, by the colonial powers in 1833, the Arrowsmith Plan for Central Perth. Um, and right from its earlier stages, it was sort of problematic. It was characterised by being a grid. It was a machine for producing private property and so private wealth. And it's, it was overlain over the now buried wetlands to the north of the city, which you can just see through here. As a result of that, um, it became really problematic. It was, it was There were plagues of mosquitoes emanating out of these wetland areas. And Perth was described as swarming with fleas and mosquitoes and that a more perfect purgatory could not be devised. Um, and soon the wetland landscapes to the north and the south of the city in conjunction with ad inadequate sewerage began to produce typhoid outbreaks. So there's a sense here of, of this colonial plan being used to provide a sense of boundedness and a sense of order within a landscape that must have seemed very alien um, and in fact hostile in some respects to the colonising power. So there's an attempt here to kind of bring it into, bring it under control and to also carve it up for the purposes of, of capitalism and for, for selling land. Now, the interesting thing to note here is George's Terrace, not the road, but the actual terrace. We can see that running along the foot of the city here. Can you guys see my mouse when I do that, or is that just visible to me? No, we can see it. Awesome. So here we have the expression of a riverfront park, which is something which is dear to James Sterling's uh, heart, which is the idea that, um, that the Fremantle was going to be the working port and Perth would be the, um, the administrative centre and Guildford would be the agricultural centre. Uh, befitting its role as an administrative centre, there's the idea of a generous, gen generous foreshore park where people can recreate in nature. And in a way, there's a remnant of this botanic paradise which Sterling had originally identified in his voyage up the river in 1827. So we can see from an interpretive lens here, there's a few things going on in terms of the, uh, the implicit kind of um, narratives and agendas which underpin this scheme to colonise space, um, to neatly order and delineate space for the, for the implementation of capitalist land rights, uh, and also the idea of public open space as a way of um, delivering public health outcomes, possibly, but also as a way of, I guess, maintaining a symbolic sort of remnant of this Arcadian paradise. So it's much more than just a park, and it's much more than just a set of lots. Interestingly, um, you wouldn't think this, but Karl Marx, Karl Marx actually cited Perth uh, in, in one of his books as, a, as an example of the failures of capitalism. And that was because when um, um, Sterling was away on a holiday, his, his surveyor Septimus Rowe um, actually subdivided and flogged off what was George's Terrace, the park, for real estate. So in no time at all, that was, um, that was flogged off. And, there was a lot of land speculation going on in Perth at the time, which is why Karl Marx had cited Perth as an example of the failures of capitalism because of these, this ram, rampant land speculation. Um, Sterling gets back from his holidays and incensed, and then he buys government house gardens, which is a remnant of this larger idea of a park. 
The book um, actually visualised these different things as to what they would look like today if these schemes had been built. And my God, it would have been a much more interesting city because St George's Terrace, the road, would truly have been a terrace overlooking the river. We would have had a topographically interesting foreshore park, uh, which would, would uh, lift up to the terrace and take you down to the water. Um, government house gardens would just progress eastwards and we still have Point Fraser. Some, will, some of you know will know Point Fraser at the moment, which is no longer a point because of reclamation. Also, Parade Ground would then return this to the central um, train station. Quite a different city. But that doesn't happen. So what happens is that we uh, subdivide it for real estate, such as, such as you can see here in the City of Perth plan. Uh, and then by 1900, there's reclamation of the river, river going on between uh, Barrack Street and William Street to try and make up for what's perceived to be a shortage of recreational land, um, which was created uh, using street sweeping, so basically horseshit from the city and also the sand resulting from the flattening of hills and landfall within the city centre more or less get dumped down onto the um, dumped down into the river. So on a pragmatic level, it, and from a you know it's it's about reclamation of the river for recreational space. But if you look at this through an interpretive research methodology, you might consider it's, it's actually this sort of unconscious impulse to replace the significant waterfront park shown in the 1833 plan, which was lost to private development. So there's a, it's a ghost, I guess, of this earlier idea uh, coming back to life and haunting us. The zenith of the plans to reclaim, Perth, uh, to reclaim land from the Perth water was reached in 1931 in the Great Depression. So we beat Dubai by over seven years in this respect. And uh, local engineer Frank Vincent proposed an artificial island 120 hectares in size by dredging the surrounding portion of Perth water to four and a half metres depth. So the idea, the island was conceived as a way of reviving confidence in Western Australia. They're in the grips of the Great Depression, providing traffic connections across the river uh, because the, the Narrows uh, wasn't there at that point. Um, but the actual program of the island was pretty vague. It was going to have a, um, a subdivision, suburban subdivision, uh, golf links for the busy city man, and an aerodrome and a shopping centre. Uh, as Vincent explained, what is the use of our commas, valuable asset, as Perth Water has been referred to, if it causes us to become bankrupt in wealth? We're in a mire of financial depression. Let us therefore secure our progress. So while it was quite impressive from the air, it would have been abhorrent from um, the ground, such an artificial island would have required extensive armoring of its edges to protect it from the flow of the river. So the edge, you'd unlikely be having sweeping uh, beaches, it would more likely be a high rocky embankment. And there's all kinds of letters in the West Australian, as you can imagine, this did precipitate some uh, commentary, uh, which basically called for Frank Vincent to be lynched, um, which, you know, which is extreme even for the West Australian. Um, I won't go into too much more detail about it, but we again um, visualised what it could have looked like today if it had been built. We speculated that the Crown City Casino would have been built on there, given the, you know, if you look at Macau and, and that, there's sort of a confluence of islands and casinos. It seems like it would be a natural, natural thing. Because of the cost of it, you probably would need to have densified it at a fairly high level to get any return out of the thing. Um, and it could have looked something like that. Um, Crown Casino there taking a um, centre centre stage. And we had a studio uh, back in the day at Audric, back when we built physical models, imagining what the island could have looked like, and that was good fun. Um, so that doesn't happen, but there's extensive um, reclamation, and you can see that here in the orange areas uh, around Perth Water, which continues right through to the 70s. Um, it's it's a huge undertaking that then requires the armouring of these edges. So it, the Esplanade was done in the 1880s, then it stretches around to the South Perth foreshore, Langley Park in the 1930s, uh, then Harrison Island is sort of formalised. So in total, 600 hectares of riverfront were reclaimed. That doesn't make, mean anything to you. That's about 300 MCG ovals. So again, uh, I mean, this is a pragmatic to some degree exercise around recreational space, but it's also a symbolic exercise, which the, the dimensions of which tend typically go unspoken. 
By the 1880s, the marshy riverine landscapes of Perth water become regarded by many as a noisome marsh, a mosquito breeding morass, and they were perceived to be in need of beautification by infilling and turfing. Um, Bill Taylor, who was an academic at the School of Design, he described it as an impulse by which native ridges, rivers had to be properly trained as instances of national enterprise. So in psychoanalytic theory, water is symbolic of the unconscious, and the Swan River from a Western perspective is to some degree associated with indigeneity. In this reading, the reclamation of the river reads as an attempt to bury this kind of history under a layer of landfill and a veneer of turf. Um, it's also a way of sanitising the Swan River's edges, um, which are, at various points were regarded as being detrimental uh, to health. And, but in, in contrast to that, the actual uh, reclamation itself was, was terrible. And some of the South Perth residents complained, the stench that is rising from the newly reclaimed Melville foreshore is appalling. Day by day, it's been growing worse, both morning and night. On many occasions, it's become almost unbearable. None of your half-hearted odors either, but a strong, putrid, acrid, nauseating stench, sufficient to make a person physically sick. Apparently, it was even tarnishing silver in the living rooms of the ladies of South Perth, um, because what was happening was the sewage washing downstream, uh, where they were reclaiming land. You had these areas of very shallow, hot water, um, full of nutrients from the sewage, which were then um, drying out in the sun and producing this nauseating stench. So the, the unconscious kind of idea of sterilising and sanitising the river actually is counterproductive, but nonetheless powerful. And we can see here by 1930, these sort of, these barren expanses of the foreshore are starting to take shape. And frankly, they haven't changed much since. It wasn't meant to be like that though. Uh, this is an earlier scheme from 1887 by the Public Works Department for a handsome river uh, foreshore park here. Um, this is in, very much emblematic of the city beautiful tradition uh, which found its fullest expression in Daniel Burnham's planning for Chicago um, but it's this idea of very civic and, and handsome uh, foreshore or, or design landscapes which not only make people physically healthy but it makes them morally more sanctifies them morally and makes them better citizens you know it's around this point that Perth which was originally a free colony uh, was getting its first loads of uh, convicts. Uh, and I think there was a sense, uh, a concern about moral degradation of the Perth colony. And the idea that, you know, you could actually civilise these otherwise unruly populations through design, through handsome civic design like this was very strong. Uh, it's an idea of environmental determinism, which is that if you put people in a certain spatial container, uh, you can affect their behaviour. It's true to some degree, but probably not um, true to the degree that these guys believed it. Nonetheless, a plan that would be by be well matured by now and, and I think a wonderful addition to the amenity of the city. But that didn't happen like many of these good ideas. It never, you know, it, it never occurred. The infilling of, of the huge expanse of Langley Park was just so um, overwhelming in terms of cost that by the time they'd had it reclaimed, everyone just sort of ran out of steam. But this was an interesting um, scheme by uh, William Bold, who served as the town clerk from 1900 to 1944, an amazing tenure. And, and he, um, he'd been to England to inspect uh, Letchworth Garden City, uh, Hampstead, Bourneville, Port Sunline and Wavertree, who, which were all expressions of the Garden City uh, movement. Do we have anyone here from the Contemporary Urbanism Unit? Yeah, there's a couple. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, you guys know all about this, you know? So you'll recognise the green belt uh, that he proposed. And this is a wonderful idea to take the um, the wetlands to the north of the city and enshrine them in open space, which is really what they should have done. Um, by now, it would be producing just the most wonderful amenity. Um, obviously, this didn't happen. Uh, a quick quiz for anyone out there. What Australian city do you think um, Bold might have been influenced by? Adelaide. Exactly. I think it was very much a take on Adelaide um, without Adelaide sort of, you know, formality, but very much that idea of a kind of inner city green belt. Um, so another idea, but again, I think this is picking up on the Garden City's 
um, idea that you can redeem the horror of the industrial city with green space and you can sanctify it with nature. Now, Perth was never heavily industrialised, but, you know, nonetheless, those narratives would have rubbed off on uh, on William Bold in his, in his trip around the UK, uh, which would have been, you know, as the Garden City was finding its fullest expression. It didn't happen, but in 1966, we got a, a wonderful um, proposition by the landscape architect John Alden. Some of you will know him from John Alden Park, which sits here, is the, um, the freeway park. So he proposed um, that we bind these fairly vacuous and sort of wasted spaces of the foreshore together, together with essentially the world's largest botanic garden. Starting in UWA with the WA Christmas tree collection, it would sweep around through Kings Park, picking up the Jarrah and the Chewets, through an exotic botanical garden along the foreshore of the city, jumps across onto Harrison Island, finishes with the exotic collection and then the um, zoological collection in the zoo. You know, a, just a, a powerful proposition that would have rendered this barren and generic, you know, green belt that we have as an urban forest of kind of epic proportions. Uh, he was promised by uh, Punch, who was the um, commissioner of the main roads, that if Oldham worked on the foreshore, uh, sorry, the interchange park, which was the world's first freeway park, which John Oldham did, and then he would see that the rest of it got built. Of course, it got Perth. John Oldham got caught up in the freeway interchange park and did some staggeringly beautiful drawings for it. Uh, however, um, once that was built, nothing happened and the rest of it just, um, you know, it went back to its its status quo, you know, fairly vacuous state. But, you know, if you go into the freeway interchange park, you can see a shadow of this vision that Oldham was trying to apply on a much broader scale. And what a beautiful thing it would have been. Um, So there's another idea there. The idea that John Oldham has, I think, is that you're starting to you're starting to get an expression of, of, of the endemic landscape bubbling up through the surface, you know, in that idea. Um, so we've been able to kind of protect Kings Park over the years, but the idea there is that the indigenous landscape can actually then from that sort of extend back into the city and re-inhabit spaces. So there's an idea there of the kind of the colonising power is starting to become indigenised to some degree. Uh, this is the, you know, interpretive research would draw those kind of conclusions. And perhaps they don't sit that far beneath the surface. I don't claim that these are huge insights, but there is a particular idea there that I think he's trying to further. Um, that doesn't happen. And what happens with vac vacant spaces in, in, in the modern period in 1966 is they get filled up full of car parking and freeways, which are the kind of detritus of modernity, reflecting the, uh, the city of Perth motto from the 1980s that some of you might remember, Kent, your car is as welcome as you are, is the big thing. And this scheme, this was a main roads department bottom drawer kind of plan for a uh, for a freeway loop or noose that would encircle the central city. It was victoriously uh, fought off by um, Paul Ritter, who was the uh, town planner of the city of Perth at the time, and they managed to get the southern leg of the freeway downgraded. This was going to be, you know, massive grade separated junctions. Now, of course, Riverside Drive that runs along here is still an arterial road, but it's nothing at the scale of what this monster would have been. And he argued that it would have choked the living out of the city, you know, choked the life out of the city. Um, apparently, there's still some ramps within the freeway interchange where a road never got built, but where you could see where it was going to fly off. I've never been able to find it, but I did read that. Um, in the end, this kind of got built as the tunnel. And I, I apologies to um, people listening in who are not from Perth. I realise there's a lot of local talk going on here, but but this one here, what the narrative here? is that Perth is to some degree insecure about its identity. Like it's this little kind of city that's never really quite found its feet and that it must clutch, it must grasp onto these symbols of modernity, of freeways, you know, the car, as to, to, to ram home this idea that it's progressive, that it's keeping up with the eastern states and the rest of the world and that should be taken seriously. And look how we can build these freeways. It's, it's the 
essentially what became the monorail in the 1980s became the light rail in the 2000s and is now morphing into the trackless tram and maybe high speed rail in the 2020s. It's a symbol as much as it is a, a, a pragmatic um, piece of infrastructure. I should say, no, actually, it's much more pragmatic, but the symbolism is still in there and it's important. Um, because of Paul Ritter's work, that doesn't happen. However, we do end up filling in Mounts Bay. So this was previously a huge bay. That was water. It was regarded as Perth's reflection pool because where you stood in um, Barrack Square, you'd get a reflection of Mount Eliza down into the water. Probably the one worst planning decision in Perth's history and the brutality of it is rendered here. It was um, There was a lady, Bessie Rishbrief, who stood in the shallows all day trying to stop the Bell Brothers trucks who were dumping sand in here. Um, there's a statue of her at Elizabeth Key, which is now here. So what we get in 1988 is City Vision, who are a local advocacy group, get this image printed on the front page of the West Australian newspaper. And this is basically about re-inhabiting that, that kind of vacuous expanse of Langley Park and turning it into a proper park. We're getting ideas of the concert hall precinct. So the concert hall, some of you will, will know, um, sort of tumbles down to the river and we get culture on the water. Uh, the Hyatt Regency jumps over the river here and we get some, you know, tricked up park kind of action. Uh, Riverside Drive is meandering now rather than a straight run to try and, I guess, pull it back to the city. So you get some areas of nature coming down to the water. So there's a, there's a kind of blurring of different agendas and, and narratives here some which relate to Oldham, some which relate to the Public Works Department plan of 1887. And we can see another scheme over here. But, you know, as an advocacy group, um, City Vision were very concerned with people's experience of the city. And, and I think there was a perception here that we need to draw people down to the river to give them access to nature. We need to draw the river back into the city to enliven the city. So there's some, you know, fundamentally solid urban design ideas. And it, it was prompted, it prompted from the City of Perth this survey, which is showing vignettes of different possible foreshore treatments for the river, for foreshore parks like Langley Park. And the interesting thing about it is, it's really exposing of what's going on in the collective kind of psyche of the city. A um, open grass fields are very popular. The one is like it a lot, uh, and the five is pretty much hated. And we can see things here like the open grass fields, natural river edges, remain dominant in the public consciousness. Um, a lively waterfront atmosphere is strongly disliked and waterfront buildings even more, even in this sort of benign uh, rendering, you know, or building, God, God help us, buildings on jetties. So it shows, it reveals to us through interpretive research that Sterling's legacy of this, the Swan River mania, mania and this Arcadian paradise of the river is still lingering in the collective consciousness. Um, 180 years later, which is, it's interesting. So there's longevity to that kind of conceptualization. Um, so it's an Arcadian escape from the city. Um, in 1991, it's all getting a bit too complicated. And when things get a bit too complicated, you have to have a design competition. Um, in this case, by um, uh, run by the state government under the Carmen Lawrence government, and it's kind of like it's got too difficult for the locals, so we'll get the internationals in. And I think this is part of a, a continuing cultural cringe in Perth. Um, hundreds of entries, fascinating. They're all stored in the basement of the city of Perth. Um, this was the winning one, and it was by a guy from this is a this is a bit of a test. A well-known urban um, designer, commentator, critic, academic from Boston who is concerned with the images of cities and how we perceive cities. Can anyone think of who that might have been? Kevin Lynch. Kevin Lynch. So this was a reasonably rare expression in his theory uh, in city form. So Kevin Lynch, thank you, Ken. Um, he, was, he, was, he did a lot of experiments with getting people to draw mental maps of how they perceived the city. And then he deconstructed the city into nodes, landmarks, axes, barriers, to understand what were the fundamental spatial morphological kind of determinants for how people form their idea of a city. He did a couple of things. He created this, this sort of follicle jetty thing called the Grand Crescent, which had 
a swan island at the end of it for breeding. You could walk to the end of this and get a postcard photo of the city. Would have been fantastic. And then um, excavating the river back to the old line of where the river used to be effectively. So going back to, again, back to Sterling's image of, uh, you know, of St George's Terrace effectively almost being on the water. Uh, and then Langley Park becomes an island, the West Australia Gardens. There's a little bit of John Oldham there and his botanic garden thing. And the freeway interchange park becomes a, a um, much more of a um, ecological kind of machine for, for cleaning water and doing different things. And this image here is walking along Terrace Road, the river coming right to the, um, the foot of the city. There's a pub in the background. And then you can go across to this um, quite romantic island on the other side. Would have been fantastic. Almost 20 years ago, this was. We should have another competition for the foreshore. Um, and uh, some, some images of, of what it could have looked like. Very, um, very pastoral, pleasant. Uh, the scheme, a lot of schemes didn't win, obviously, as it generally happens in competitions. This was a scheme by Landmark Consultancy, a guy called Jared Ciro, who occasionally, he comes to a lot of events. But this was about uh, indigenizing the foreshore completely, you know. At this point, Perth was just ripping through, letting it rip on the fringes and just tearing through biodiversity, frankly, much as it still is. And it, there was some kind of idea of symbolically, um, I guess, um, compensating for that in the city centre. You know, so there's, there's a, the water penetrates back into the land and it's indigenised, you know. Other fantastic schemes. This is a family, the Kira family from Mount Lawley. Um, doing wonderful things like uh, taking the foreshore roads right back into the city, let the um, river kind of bleed right up through the city, bring it to the foot of the city, you know, in this strange kind of curvilinear geometry. Um, I won't try and interpret that too much. This was the, um, the uh, there was a kind of architect prize for this one or something. Uh, it was an uh, unofficial prize and it was given to the local firm Donaldson Warren, who, who, proposed an urban kind of transect from what is now Elizabeth Quay right through to the cultural centre. And this is a premonition of things to come, albeit a kind of slightly Russian constructivist looking one, a similar thing going on with Wellington Square and how fantastic that would be to have punched that Hausman-like axiom through, connecting that in, and then the, the kind of landscape campus precinct of Council House and, and the Supreme Court and the like. So this is about an image of a confident urban Perth, and it's a premonition of ones that come later. Uh, in the end, the Carmen Lawrence government gets caught up in all kinds of scandals, uh, and the foreshore uh, scheme is consigned to the dustbin of history, like many before it. And uh, there is not much left to be shown from it other than um, the bell tower. There was the idea of some sort of monument at the end of uh, Barrack Street. In the end, um, uh, Little Dicky, uh, Richard Court, who followed Carmen Lawrence, uh, ended up building that, but everything else didn't happen. And so it just sits there and there's a kind of, um, there's a murmur of schemes that kind of uh, just sort of emanate occasionally, but nothing's taken particularly seriously. Um, and until uh, in 2007, there was a competitive tender process orchestrated by the Office of Government Architect and Ashton Ragan McDougall and Richard Weller, who was the old director of Audrey, they won with this a proposal a bit like this. So it was this, um, the scheme was structured by this sort of public gesture of a river circle. So it's, it's cutting back into the Esplanade, bringing the river back to the city, but at the same time, time taking the river, the city back out to the river, you know. Um, and in terms of our interpretive research sort of lens on this thing, this is a kind of reflecting a growing desire for Perth to become more activated, vibrant, diverse, to become less of a country town and more of a real city. Um, Perth had become exceptionally self-conscious and you wouldn't really think it now, but people were going around Perth and these were locals who loved the place calling it Dullsville. It's funny, no one says that anymore, but for a couple of years there, it was, everyone was calling it Dullsville. Happened. Just losing your jaws, hang on a sec. No worries. Man. Um, do you want me to, uh, what are you seeing now? You're back. You're back now. We've got you. I don't know something. Actually, my my screen's come up. Oh, maybe that's for me to get rid of. Uh, how's that? Oh, now? Yeah. 
Brilliant. Um, You're back. So, um, it, Dull, no worries. Thank you. Yeah. I've lost your audio. He said it's so pristine, it's almost antiseptic. And he said if it had a heart, it didn't have a heartbeat. Um, so this was a kind of reaction to such damning assessments where finally the city breaks through this sterilising green belt and, um, and lurches out into the uh, city. Still got me? Yep. Awesome. Uh, this was a sultry kind of scheme, uh, our image of the scheme that got uh, published in the West Australian and um, this alienated a lot of people. And this was a shame because that building at the front didn't ne need to be nearly as large. But once the render got out there, it was all over. And it was interpreted by the press, as, or got nicknamed Dubai on the Swan, and it never recovered from that nickname um, and got pilloried. And, and that was because of this tall, rather phallic thing right up in your front of your face. And also the Swan Island, which was a bit of a reference to um, the palms in Dubai, a bit of a super graphic indigenous cultural centre down here. So the scheme got ditched. It was really nothing like that's the Burj Al Arab, um, as it really would be would have been if you'd plonked that down there. That was that building. So, um, you know, that was the perception. And once that perception's out there, it's very difficult to shift. In 2010, we get the Labor to Liberal government. They basically keep the design team, but say we don't like circles, we want a square. Um, so it's much more, and that, you know, you can interpret that as being much more like these sort of honest post-industrial Australian waterfronts, such as Circular Quay and Melbourne Docklands, were all rectilinear. So, you know, I think it's about, you know, Barnett trying to position this waterfront development within that kind of um, rubric of, of post in, honest post-industrial waterfront redevelopment, as opposed to this weird kind of slightly Dubai-esque circular thing, which the Labor's government have pursued. Um, City Vision get back involved again, um, and they they propose a somewhat similar rectangular, rectangular thing, but they keep the ceremonial space of of the Esplanade, which is now gone, but which is where the Anzac Day marches occurred, and they proposed that Riverside Drive should be um, sent across the inlet in a kind of sculptural uh, Calatrava-esque like bridge. And we get this, uh, this fantastic debate going on between the city gatekeepers, who are a bit like the equivalent of the Tea Party in American politics, um, against Future Perth, who are the, like the young guns, or I guess like, um, well, I don't know who they were like, but there's this, uh, you know, the city gatekeepers uh, produced a badge here, I badged the waterfront in this kind of um, almost nuclear winterish kind of like a grey, cold London kind of vibe, uh, and say, here's what you lose, which is the wonderful democratic expression in the foreshore. This is gets rebadged by Future Perth, uh, saying, here's what you get, we just lose a bunch of turf, and frankly, we have enough of that. And this this goes to the point of interpretive research because the thing about this side is that it's not, the contention around this site is not just what do we do with the foreshore. The site is an expression of, of, of a much deeper idea of what Perth is about, uh, how we relate to Perth's sense of place, uh, how we should relate to the river, to indigeneity, how do we relate to each other, how do we relate to our political masters, and, and protests are a big part of this. Uh, and all of this, this, you know, there's just so much of this kind of stuff which swirls around the foreshore, which means that I think part of the reason we struggled to do anything for so long is because everything is so encumbered with this baggage, which interpretive research can quickly reveal, um, that you get these very polemical and hysterical debates because you're not just talking about what to do with this, you know, a couple of hectares of land. You're talking about, well, what is the city about? And that's where it gets kind of interesting. So it's a battle for the city. It's not just a battle for the um, for the waterfront. Ashton Rag and McDougall, though, they're, they're used to producing um, architecture, which is, you know, to some ugly, to others at least challenging. And so they, they're quite happy with controversy. And, and I got to work on this scheme with uh, Robert Cameron, who some of you will know, and uh, as uh, just members of a much bigger team, uh, schemes we worked on for 2011, uh, all done with a script in, in Rhino, in Grasshopper, which generates kind of these topographic sort of like <coughs> It was all about the script. It was maddening, but, you know, interesting. Uh, 2014, it's photorealist renders are starting to appear, showing this confident urban expression of the city on the water. 
Um, and then here we can see um, more of those those patterns. As an anecdote, my sister had some paving done around the pool uh, not long after Elizabeth Key was finished. And um, the guy said he'd just come from Elizabeth Key and my sister said to him, oh, oh, my brother worked on that, you know, and I can't repeat what he said, but he said, tell him he's an F and I, I won't repeat it. But it seems like these patterns didn't get many favours and many fans amongst the people building it. Uh, at least if that sample group of one was anything to go by. And two thicks, 2016, I can't believe it was that long ago, it opens. And um, and we all know it now. Um, just very quickly, we're almost there. Um, looking forward, you know, it's just interesting to reflect that there's been, I think it's over seven different Indigenous cultural centres proposed in this area over the years. We've never built any. Um, there's many <laughs> one that people got sort of handballed into the second stage of works. And uh, I think that's where it's going to stay. Uh, so that, that's, you know, there's a loss there. Just quickly looking forward, um, you know, again, interpretive research, sea level rise in one sense is just water rising and it prompts a whole bunch of pragmatic questions about retreat and can you even fortify it? You can't really, not in this kind of geo geotechnical environment because it's just, you know, it's mud. Um, so you have a situation here where um, the reclamation of the city becomes, in a way, um, a mirroring of our reclamation of the city in the, in the um, 19th and 20th centuries, which is that the reclamation of the city by the river is not just a pragmatic thing, it's also a symbolic thing. So the wobble here is not just a creative force, a benign creative force, but it is a punisher of wrongdoing. Now, I'm not saying that flooding is is first and foremost an unconscious expression of the wobble. But on what I'm saying is this, rec this sort of true reclamation of the city by the river um, has a kind of a symbolic uh, dimension. You know, as I said before, water is associated in psychoanalytic theory with the unconscious. So there's things bubbling back to the surface here, uh, which is unsettling to a colonial culture which still has significantly unfinished business with Indigenous culture and with the land and the landscape. Now, you might you might think that's all a bit, um, a bit overcooked, but I, I believe that these narratives, are, uh, they are buried in this kind of thing, you know, and um, it, pr it prompts a whole bunch of things, you know, which is pragmatically, to what degree can we defend against this? Uh, how do you do retreat? Um, how do you do it in a way which, you know, deals with the fact that it's going to be, you know, hugely unpopular and that there'll be a public expectation that you just build a wall, a big wall, uh, and that will go Dutch on it, um, which, as I've said, won't work anyway. At the same time, you know, we've got a lot of significant population growth in Perth and it's like, how do you deliver? How do you use the river as a, as a kind of source of amenity to lure people into a high density setting? It has a role there. You know, how do we deal with a fragmented kind of control of land ownership around the river? How do we bind it together in sort of one urban room and look at it systematically, you know? Now, of course, the Elizabeth Key is a good thing, but it's only 300 metres of this, uh, this you know, huge expanse. Uh, in terms of ways of binding it together, uh, uh, Len Collard, who's a Noongar elder, proposed that some of you will know uh, the statue of Jagen on, on um, Harrison Island. It's just a small statue. It used to get its head cut off by Bogan, well, not Bogans, by racists with angle grinders. Um, and his idea was that you'd actually build Jagen properly out there with no head. Um, and that uh, on Australia Day, it would shoot fireworks out of its neck. Uh, on the other days of the years, you'd catch a lift up its leg and through the torso and there'd be a lookout up there. And it'd be a kind of Statue of Liberty thing. The background was to it that um, Lisa Scafidi, who used to be on our board and is now no longer in public life, had proposed that we needed a Statue of Liberty-like figure in the middle of the river to unify it as one room, um, one urban kind of room, kind of consolidate it all. Uh, but no one could ever think who the statue should be of. It's pretty difficult in Australian culture where we're so into cutting down tall poppies that we couldn't really imagine the one person who would be able to carry that off. So that was Lynn Collard's idea, and um, certainly a polarising one, but I think would capture something of the unfinished business 
of colonial indigenous relations, but also capture some of um, the irreverence, I guess, of Australian culture. Um, other schemes to bind it together. This was a, a great scheme by architect Ian Molyneux in the 1980s. His daughter used to be um, office admin at Baldrick. And he said we should we should take the uh, the politicians down from on the hill where they down and look at where they look down on us, and we should put their hat, parliament house down here. And we can look down on them, and it also conform with Richard Weller's ideas that you should put your trophies on the front lawn. We'll take all the stuff out of the cultural centre and we'll bang it on the uh, foreshore, and we'll connect it with high speed rail, theatre complexes, art galleries, medical, university, uh, high density residential, all connected, you know, by a uh, high speed ferry. A bit like Canberra, to be honest. And then we could turn um, Parliament House into a casino, was Ian Molyneux's interesting idea, um, which I think Fernando shows could probably work. Uh, 2015, this is basically how it looked, and it still looks like this. So there's a lot of unfinished business. And so we're moving into this era where the river will, you know, as opposed to us reshaping the river according to our own conscious or unconscious impulses, in this century, it'll be the other way around. To some degree, the river is going to reclaim these areas. And this is a kind of humbling situation for, for you know, European, Australian and, and colonial culture. And we don't really have, um, we don't really have a vision for how we should go about this. Melbourne works to a vision of the same, uh, if I'm saying that right, which is um, for the Yarra, which is the river from Paris, which is the idea of an urban river. But, um, for Perth, we don't have a clear vision for a river, I would say. Uh, and this is tricky because rivers and, and foreshores are where cultures tend to construct and express their identity. So the, the, this whole process of envisioning, you know, what should happen in Bunumbira, Perth water, is actually part of envisioning who we should be as a culture and what our identity is and how we'll relate to landscape and ecological systems and indigeneity. And no wonder that, you know, with the all the pragmatic issues swirling around, that becomes pretty difficult to um, to deal with. And henceforth just get, sort of gets handballed down the road. This was what was meant to be the cover of the book, but I wasn't allowed to because of copyright. A Frederick Garlick's image here, Stirling going up river in 1827 um, with the very phallic uh, Dubai and the Swan scheme. The, the past flying into the future and all that. Uh, I regret that I couldn't have used that, so I show it now whenever I can the presentation. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks, Jules.